were made by the Dreamtime spirits. For Aboriginal people, they aren't changed. White laws can be changed so many times, mm -hmm. but with our culture, it never changes. And both men and women are custodians of this country of the dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so wherever we go, wherever we are, there are sites there, very significant places mm -hmm. all over this country because we are part of this earth and we are this country. Reconciliation is a big word. Maybe it's not very clear to people. When you say that it's all about truth, and that means knowing the truth, knowing the history, learning the culture, and being decent. And I think that's fairly irresistible to most people. It's acceptance, and it's accepting one another. I prefer to think of reconciliation as a, a bridge building time. Mm. Um, because a lot of our people are not happy with the word reconciliation, mm -hmm. but they do accept the word build bridge, building bridges. And he said, you know, what a shame. White fellas have never given black fellas the chance to welcome them to, into their country. <laughs> Flying now, Maybe while we're, while we're yeah. sitting here, you aunties might like to talk to me about seeing I'm a young fella, young one. Yeah. Tell me about some of the protocols and things that we should be thinking mm. about in this reconciliation. One well, protocol I think we should all remember. Uh, there's other protocols when coming into country. Um, been welcomed in and um, I found that coming here um, into this new part of the country, I've never been here before so I don't know much history of the the uh, traditional owners that were here. This is a yeah. Thurrawal, this is Thurrawal land, is it? Thurrawal. Yeah, this, oh, this, right. and down there there are over 300 sites that this house oh. looks down on, on oh, Holsworthy. Yeah. So Great. yeah, this is Thurrawal land, we, find out, we found out when we bought this land whose land it was on. So, mm. so in a way you've welcomed us. Mm. Yes, um. we welcome you <laughs> onto Thurrawal land. Thurrawal. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We were sitting around a campfire and um, Muljali, I can say his name because that isn't his, um, that, that, that isn't his skin name. Long time ago he said, when strangers came into our country, we would go out to welcome them. And he said we'd do the jumbas, that's what they call corroborees in, in um, Nyaranyan country. And he said, and, and we would tell the stories of our countries and the stranger Aborigines would tell the stories of their countries through their jumbas. And he said, sometimes these jumbas would go on maybe for one day, maybe two days, maybe even longer. And then at the end of it all, he said, we didn't think of them as strangers. We thought of them as friends because we knew they had the wooden good, the spirit of the country in their hearts and therefore they would never damage the land either. And he said, you know, what a shame. White fellas have never given black fellas the chance to welcome them to, into their country. And this is so sad. He said, not only for white fellas, but black fellas too. Because if white fellas understood and had the one good in their hearts like we do, then they would have the same belonging to country that we have. That was when I started to think, well, what can I do? to try and help the reconciliation process. If only we had heard these stories, then we would have a much stronger sense of belonging. When I did have an opportunity to go into Aboriginal Australia in urban and tribal areas, I found that there were things I could immediately connect with. And there was a connection of the heart as well, and a feeling of finding there the deep roots of the country, which I had not been able to find up to that point. And it's beautiful how the culture has evolved this way of belonging to land, uh, which ownership and possession doesn't take into account. 
these thousands of years which enable um, Aboriginal people to feel that belonging. We came to Australia in order to escape uh, Hitler's policy of genocide against the Druids. And so I understand uh, the feelings of, of being uprooted, of being a child removed from family, friends, school, put into a very strange environment. We arrived in Australia into a policy of assimilation Yes. And therefore we dropped, we dropped our cultural bundles and we dropped our ethnic languages. And, um, and this is the pity of it. Because you can never forget your roots. You can, I could never forget my little village. I could never forget my Greek. I could never forget my Greek religion. I have an 11-year-old son. I took him to Greece three times because I want him to know where he has come from, where his parents and grandparents and other parents, and where he belongs. I was uh, a stolen, part of the, um, one of the stolen generation, so it was really important for me to know where I belonged. When I went to a sacred site, it was a, a birthing place, and I'd always had this um, longing in me to say, well, I never really said goodbye to mum, and I actually, went to an, a birthing place, I was taken there, permission to go in, everything was done right. And I actually, at that birthing place, in spirit, I went right back into my mother's womb. Mm, and it was amazing. amazing. And, and, you know, that didn't come from um, um, any religious belief. No, mm -hmm. That's Things what like that. sacred sites, when Aboriginal people talk about sacred sites, mm. This is what it's really all about, where the, the spirit is there, you know. That took away that real deep longing. That sort of healing is what's got to happen to anybody that's been hurt, um, whether they've been forcibly removed, whether they've been taken from their land, whatever way it's been. <laughs> We are still the sovereign mm. owners of this country. We've never relinquished it. Mm. We've never signed a treaty. Mm. And we, we've got to keep enforcing that into our children because we're really, we're not dispossessed people. We still walk this land. We still are the owners of this land. We belong to the land. If we lose our native title, I feel there won't be any reconciliation. Mm. But if we still have our native title and there's still no apologies from the Prime Minister and mm. whoever, I do think there'll be reconciliation mm. because I think we'll all work at that still. What is in question, certainly with the native title and with the WIC, is, is having the opportunity to go on the land, not to take over it. One of the other things I've learned from Aborigines is that their sense of they of the word ownership is inclusive it includes everybody and that's what me, makes me sad to think that the majority of pastoralists are actually poorer people for not having sat down and listened i had the opportunity to meet a woman who started off as a, a, a tafe student and she always talked about her people and herself as a curry this helped me to understand that it wasn't what, how dark her skin was, it was her concept of herself that really mattered. When I'm in the South, people say I'm Torres Strait, and when I'm with some Torres Strait people, you say I've been with the Aboriginal people too long, so I'm more <laughs> Aboriginal there. Yeah, when I'm with white people, they say you're black. And when you're with black people, you say, you're white. So I say to everybody, I'm me. I heard the elders saying then to the people, like, you know, you're either Aboriginal or you're not now. None of this business. So when anyone says to me, you, you've got a bit Aboriginal in you, you know, and say, well, look, I'm all Aboriginal. The ministers, you know, the yeah. Aboriginal affairs ministers, and they're saying, oh, the real Aborigines are the... Mm. The real ones. Yeah, the yeah. real yeah. Aborigines, yeah. you know. The real ones. And, and um, you know, you... you you come up against that all the time yes. when you, and sometimes, you, you know, you have to really address these things straight away. Yes. They seriously don't understand mm. that mm. those people can be Aboriginal because they immediately think of traditional Aboriginal people. They immediately think of skin colour yeah, yes. as yes. defining them yeah. being Aboriginal, yeah. but it doesn't. I mean, what defines me being Irish?
Pretty easy. As against the student. Ah, go on. No, no, but you see, exactly the same thing happens. And I've had it said to me here, ah, you're not really Irish because you come from the city and you don't come from the West. Yeah. That's exactly the same thing. That makes me an urban Irish as against a tribal Irish. Well, I was born in central New South Wales, central western New South Wales, and I went to a one-teacher school and there are black children there. And it wasn't until I read Sally Morgan's book that I realised that they were Aboriginal because I th we were always told they're Indian. And when she talks about being Indian in the book, I suddenly go click. And I said, well, why do we call them Indian? And they said, well, it was better than being Aboriginal. Yes. And my father always said, keep yourself nice and tidy if you're going to be in the uh, white society. They're going to look at you. <laughs> keep yourself <laughs> nice and tidy. <laughs> Gossamer hairspray when it first came out. <laughs> I had done it up, really done myself up. And when I'd mention, my husband was a white man, ah, oh, well, that's, you know, that's the, why. the face that expressions, the it. body language would yeah. stick out a mile. That that's it. why she's got her hair into place. That's why she's dressed, oh, uh, uh, you know, with this magic white touch. Yeah, you I, know? Get that. Mm -hmm. I looked at the old matron's uh, reports, and over the years, you know, she has to write this day, monthly report. And when I was, uh, when I was, it must have been really good, or when I was bad, when she described my complexion, I was sometimes I was almost white, mm. and when I must have been playing up at the time, <laughs> I, she described my complexion as very dark, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. and you know, and it really hit me yeah. that that's how they mm. see you, that's you know, right. and and a lot of non-Aboriginal people out there judge us by the colour of our skin. Yes. Mm. What we must do is not make fe people feel because they didn't know the Aboriginal culture. They are out it's because they feel that they, they feel that they are not good enough to be in this movement because we recognise that the reconciliation process now has become the people's movement. Can I tell you something? In order to change situations in a society, you have to educate and legislate. Exactly. Right. So we need leadership. And unless there is leadership from the Prime Minister, the people out there, they're scared. Some of them are scared. The other ones, like us, we know the issues, we've been through them, and we're doing something about it. We raise children, we teach them to apologise, and we say, you must say sorry in order to make progress and move on to the next area. He's a man who says he's a family man, yes. and he can't do the fundamental things that you do in families, which is deal with the past in order to pro make progress in the future. There are apologies happening everywhere. The churches are apologising, different people, the sorry yeah. books around, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the Aboriginal people know that this isn't just for stolen babies, but this is sorry for what we've done to you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You, you. I mean, if somebody says sorry to you, you feel like forgiving them, yeah. especially mm. if they mean it. reconciliation process has really given a platform for people in a non-threatening way to come together because before people felt uncomfortable on both sides and I think this has been the only thing in this country that's given everybody this chance to yeah. become yeah. united. Yeah. Yes. What reconciliation has done, the process anyway, has allowed us to have a say yeah. yes. and, and people can't hear us enough.
have to be practical and to do some practical things to demonstrate, you know, that we really uh, care for each other and also that we are all the people of Australia. We took um, a youth children to the Aboriginal land and then we show them the, the kind of culture, the kind of uh, uh, way of life they were living. And for them, it was an excellent uh, experience, which has encouraged others, like the girls, they, they were wearing a special T-shirt, which they bought from there. And they were really proud for people to ask them, where did you get this T-shirt from? So each one of us does one thing. But I think that we have to encourage people to be part of a movement. One person speaking alone is not going to be enough. I know I want change. And I have to change too, I know that. So we started this group called uh, Wicked and we decided that we would run old-fashioned political meetings which would be empowering. And the contract was we did the organisation, we asked the speakers, we made it possible for the Aboriginal people's voices to be heard and we took the background position. If someone else comes along and says, I'll run a meeting in my area and suddenly we've got 10 meetings going. I include Aboriginal in nearly every single thing of my work that I do. Mm. Uh, it just comes in even if people think it's a pain, which yes. some of them do. I mean, I know people who think, I wish she'd shot up. Mm. Yes. Last year at my graduation mm. ceremonies, what I did when I got up was welcome people to Ngunnawal country. Well, nobody's ever done this at a university before, and I could see some of the people sitting on the stage nearly going off their faces. Mm. And I thought, well, it's too bad, but by the end of nine graduation ceremonies, it has had the most enormous effect. Just somebody in, in school who's got a kid at school can say to the principal of the school, but could you make sure every day at assembly that we just acknowledge country? You don't have to be the chancellor of a university. Mm, right. I've just moved and I'm in Camaragal country and uh, find it out and, and say it like a grace. It's yes, great. Yes, yes, yes. People can volunteer their services to participate not in functions that they create, but in other people's functions. Attend that school fate and do something there to focus people's attention. It could be a small exhibition of, of, of the, uh, Aboriginal art. It could be some storytelling because there is nothing as powerful as giving people a small task which they can do. It's a passion for the possible. I wear Aboriginal colours around the place. And I have decided quite carefully that when people say, what's that in aid of? Uh, I say, well, it's to remind us that we're in a process of reconciliation with Aboriginal people. The Greek <laughs> festival, they got together and they said, look, we want the Aboriginal people to come closer to us and to sit and talk so we can listen. So I thought, gee, that was a great idea. So we did. One man got up, he was that angry, it's a shame on me, mm. being a resident in this country. He said, I want to sign that book, yeah. because I am sorry to. Afterwards, when we finished talking, they come down and they just held us. Mm. Mm. Just for one second, never spoke, but mm. just held us. And that's the kind of response. It's going to put that black hand and that white hand together and walk. Yeah. Yeah. Saying sorry, that's not enough. We've got to do something. Reconciliation actually comes from the word concilium, which is convoking, talking together. It's just as simple as that. And we don't talk together. We won't know each other. This is a perfect opportunity for us as a complete society to, uh, to dig within ourselves and go out and, and uh, acquire some better conflict resolution techniques. Yes. We can be political and not be confrontational. Absolutely. We can be uh, 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 forthright and still be reconciling in all of this. And we will serve uh, at the cause of reconciliation much better if we do this in a way which is inclusive just as the, uh, 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 the Aboriginal concept of land is inclusive. I think it's very important for people, whoever they are, to maintain their culture, their language, their religion, and everything that is important to them, you know, within the setting that we are. And together, 
you know, uh, we have unity in diversity. And I believe that without addressing the indigenous issue, there is not going to be any peace in this land. So we are all tied up with the land. This is now our home, and there should be uh, a continuation of the talk and the conversation and the search for peace. I was at a reconciliation um, meeting last week at Manly, and um, part of me wanted to cry. Part of me was sad, and I wanted to cry because I, I just feel sad about the political situation that's in the country at the moment. Mm. But the other part of me wanted to cry because I was so happy to see mm. so many people, like there were 500 people there, mm. and, uh, and, and walk away with a bit more knowledge, a bit more bridge yeah. building take mm. place mm. Uh, to help with this healing. So I, I'm feeling a little bit, bit happier about the healing that's taking place. Mm. And I don't think it'll finish by year 2001. Mm. I mm. think that we will just continue on to whatever that we have energy. Yeah. And, yeah. and as far as healing the nation is concerned, we as Aboriginal individuals and women, we need to heal ourselves first. Mm. We have to have a lot of healing in ourselves mm. and then we can heal our families and help heal our communities and then it just spreads out. So true. Mm. And I think that once that starts to happen um, and as we unite more with our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, mm. I think that the, you know, I can't see how it can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.